Father, we lift our eyes, our hearts upon you. Lord, we come before you, creator of the universe, God of all glory. We ask that you draw us near, lift us up as we worship you this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome today to our worship. tremble did you feel the mountains tremble did you hear the oceans roll when the people rose to sing of jesus christ the risen one did you feel the people tremble did you hear the singers roar when the lost began to sing of Jesus Christ, the saving one? We can see, we can see that God is moving a mighty river through the nations when young and old return to Jesus. darkness tremble do you feel the darkness tremble when all the saints join in one song and all the streams flow as one river to wash away your brokenness again do you feel the darkness tremble when all the saints join in one song and all the streams flow as one river to wash away our brokenness. And we can see, and we can see that God is moving a mighty river through the nations. When young and old will turn to Jesus, Play wide to heavenly
when the music fades. When the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come, longing just to bring something that's worth that will bless your. much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship when it's all about you it's all about you Jesus I'm sorry Lord for the Endless worth. King of endless worth, no one could express how much you deserve. Though a weak and poor, all I have is yours, every single. It's all 
about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it when it's all about you. It's all about you, Well, welcome to our worship this week. It's been a, an interesting week. We've seen a relaxing of restrictions placed upon us. And we're wondering what that means for us as a church. At the moment, um, a working group of churches and other religious bodies have met with the government, consulted with the government, put recommendations to the government and are waiting to see if the government will actually take their advice or whether they will, the government will just do its own thing. We don't know. We're wanting to be able to make really firm plans for next Sunday. The reality is we're still waiting for the government to release the industry plan for places of worship. Until that's released... We're not sure what we're planning for, but we are planning to be here next Sunday. And as soon as we can get hold of that, we can make definite plans and we'll be making that known to you. Let's come before the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, our Father who art in heaven, we pray that, Lord. But often in praying that, we are guilty of making you our Father as though you were a possession. But the reality is that you are the Father of us. You are our Creator, you are our Redeemer and you are our Lord. It is not for us to tell you, but for us to listen. Father, as we gather we gather at the feet of the God who reigns in heaven. We want to lift up on high the name of Jesus. Father, we pray that your name would be hallowed. Yet we are aware, Lord, that many things we do bring down the name of of Jesus. Father, where we have been guilty, we pray you would forgive us, that you would restore us, that you would renew us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Lord, remind us that this is about your kingdom coming. The fact that it is not here fully yet though it is here, that there is the best yet to come. And Lord, we look forward to that day when you shall reign on high and there will be no division, no turning away, that all hearts would be turned to you. Lord, we look to your coming kingdom. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, remind us that we are your servants, your stewards, your people, here to do your will. Lord, you rule over heaven. Rule in our hearts. Rule in our church. Rule in our nation. Rule in our midst. Father, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Oh Lord, we live in a land of abundance. We do not, as a hungry urchin, come before you begging for a morsel of food. But rather, choice abounds around us. You, the God who feeds the birds of the air who neither gather nor store. How much more you care for us. How much more you provide for us. Lord, the bread we need, so desperately need, is the bread of life, Jesus. Father, give us a full measure of the Spirit of Christ that we might be your people. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And Lord, how often we are indignant when others sin against us and yet we take lightly the harsh treatment we give to others. Father, we pray that you would lay on our hearts those things we need to ask forgiveness for. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lord, this is a difficult land. And temptation does not come as much from without as it does come from within. Lord, for you to lead us out of temptation, we have to stop coveting. We have to stop desiring. We have to stop looking. Father, let us follow Jesus. Let us follow him. And Lord, we want to bring the burdens of our hearts before you also. For you gave us in your scriptures the words of Peter, that we should cast our cares upon you, for you care for us. Lord, we, we rejoice. This week we prayed for Mrs. Gard as she was taken to hospital in great pain. And now she is back home, restored to her daughters. Lord, we thank you. You are the God who hears and answers prayer. And there are so many other things we bring before you. Lord, we lay them at your feet, knowing that you care for us. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. This week, we're continuing in our new series where we look at who God is. Last week, we asked the question, is it reasonable to believe in God? This week, we're wanting to look more at who God is. The technical term for today is the attributes of God as we look to discover the nature, the person of our God. Our reading today comes from the book of Exodus. This is uh, where Moses goes up into the mountains and is given the commandments. And we're picking up in chapter 34 of Exodus and I'm going to pick up in verse 4. And this is Exodus chapter 34 picking up in verse 4. And he you and he hewed out two tablets of stone like unto the first. And Moses rose up early in the morning and went up into the Mount Sinai, as the Lord had commanded him, and took in his hand the two tablets of stone. And the Lord descended in a cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him, proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children 
and upon the children's children unto the third and fourth generation. And Moses made haste, bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. Amen. That is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. My father-in-law used to speak about the miller's seat. When he had retired from work, he would go shopping with my mother-in-law, Jean, and as they would go through the plaza of the big city, they would get to the miller's store and invariably my mother-in-law would go in and Alan would sit and wait on the chair that the shopping mall had provided out the front. And this was not unusual and over the years he got to strike up many conversations with other husbands on the miller's chair. But when we go into country areas, a similar thing happens, but it happens a little differently. And it's not called the miller's chair in the country. It's usually called the chair of knowledge or the chair of wisdom or something of that nature. Because what happens is in country towns come market day, the husbands, the farmers, they take their wives into town. And shopping is quite a chore in a, shop, in a country town. Uh, you could be in a, a district where you can go 50 kilometres in any direction before you find another town. And in that area that is served by that town, there might be 1,500, 2,000 people. And everybody knows everybody. I've lived in towns like that. And so when the wives get into the supermarket, it takes probably three times longer in these smaller supermarkets to do the shopping than what it would take in a big city. Because every time they turn a corner into the aisle, there's Mrs Jones and then there's a conversation. And then they get a bit further down that aisle and before they put another thing into the trolley, there's another conversation. And three hours later, the wives emerge with their, their couple of bags of groceries. Meanwhile, the husbands congregate on the town bench that is placed near the, the main grocery store, the post office, and perhaps one or two other places. And it's generally called the seat of wisdom or the seat of knowledge. And you'll find each week or each fortnight, there will be the same crowd of men gathered around that bench Seated, seated central is the town's guru. His deputies either side and then his uh, lesser disciples gathered around standing and he will be guiding the conversation. Well, the story is told that at a certain seat of knowledge in a certain country town, a young man came up one day and he excused himself and he said, I'm looking for a new town to live in. I'm wondering if you could tell me what this town is like. All eyes immediately turn on the town sage. He looks up at the young man. He says, I'll tell you what this town is like, but first, tell me what the town was like that you lived in. The young man's face darkened. He said it was a terrible town. The people there were absolutely horrid. And he went on at length to describe how unpleasant the last town was that he lived in. When he finally stopped, the sage looked up to him and he said, I expect you'll find this town 
much the same. With that, the young man went off, got in his car and began driving to the next town. Some months later, this scene is repeated. Another young man comes up and excuses himself and asks exactly the same question. The guru looks up and gives him the same reply. I'll tell you what this town is like, but first tell me about the town you came from. A smile lit this young man's face as he began to describe the wonderful warm relationships he'd had with the town. And with a a hint of sadness, he shared that his mother had become ill and would spend many months in hospital and he needed to move closer to the big city so that he could visit her regularly. He said, if it wasn't for that, I never would have left. The town sage looked up at him and he said, I expect you'll find the people of this town just as you found the people where you have come from. The young man looked relieved, went off in search of the real estate agent to find a place to live. After he'd walked away, one of the younger disciples that was standing about observing all this, he remarked, he said, Fred, I remember a couple of months ago, a young man came and asked the same question and you sent him his way and told him it would be a terrible town. Now you're telling this young man it's a great town. How does that work? Oh, says Fred, it's not about the town. It's about the young man. People find people as they are. The first young man was angry and miserable. He brought out the worst in the people around him. If he had come here, he would have brought out the worst in us. And we would have seen. He only would have seen the bad in us. The second young man saw, brought out the good. He saw good. He, he delighted in the people he knew. And he would have brought that attitude with him. And people would have responded in like manner to him and he would have found and he will find this a great place to live. Hmm. That's a nice little story. I don't know if it's true, I suspect it's not, but it's a good bit of human wisdom. But in coming to God, I think there is an element of truth in our story that we need to observe. I believe that people perceive God as they are and there is a great temptation for us to build God, to make God, to form God in our own image. And because of that we see different ideas of God being built around us. We see different fashions, different passions being put and they become the models of God. And so as a church, as a people of the book, it is important that we build our understanding of God not upon our own personalities, not upon our own ideas, not upon our own patterns, but we build our understanding of God upon scripture as God has revealed himself. There are things about God that we could probably work out if we did not have the Bible, but there are other things about God we would never know unless he revealed them to us. And in our uh, reading before, taken from Exodus, we had a list of several attributes of God in that one thing. As he passed by Moses, 
He said he was merciful, gracious, long-suffering. Within him was goodness and the truth that he was forgiving. But he was also a righteous judge. And we can go through the scriptures and we discover that there is a whole list. And I did a quick list and I'm sure it's nowhere near complete. And I got 21 attributes of God. 21 attributes of God taken from the scriptures. I'll read them through quickly. I won't give you the scripture references just yet. God is infinite. He is unchanging. He is the life giver. He is all powerful. He is truth. He is all knowing. He is ever present. He is all wise. He is faithful. He is good. He is just. He is merciful. God is gracious, loving, holy, glorious, jealous. He is a provider. He is transcendent. He is not captured by our presence. He can be wrathful and he is also invisible. Wow, that's a list. If I went through all the Bible references there, well, I think we might be here for another couple of hours. But let's have a look at some of the unique qualities of God. Qualities that only God has in himself that we could never have. And let's have a look at some qualities that we share with God because we are made in his image. Let's begin with the infinite. In Colossians and in the Psalms, we are told that God is both before all creation and is the source of creation. His understanding is infinite. Let's move on. Malachi 3 verse 6. God does not change. Here we discover, and the technical term we use is immutable. Malachi chapter 3 verse 6, where he says, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, the sons of Jacob are not consumed. How about that? Here is God who's talking about the sins of the people. He calls them the sons of Jacob at that point. Why does he call them the sons of Jacob? Because he wants to point out that his mercy upon them is not based on their behaviour, but because of the promise that he had made to their ancestors. God is faithful to his promises. He does not change. In John chapter 5, verse 26, we discover that Jesus is the life giver. And I want to have a look at that verse. Let's turn to that. We're in the Gospel of John, chapter 5, and we're picking up in verse 26. I'm doing this deliberately today. I'm taking a little bit of time to turn up the pages myself without bookmarking them. Usually I bookmark them and I can go flip, flip, flip through my Bible. And with recording the messages, I've been sitting and uh, I've been guilty of uh, rattling out a reading and then getting into the reading and the people watching, I'm watching them, they're going flip, flip, flip and I've gone, I've finished the reading before they start. So I'm, I'm doing this the way that people will do it as they work with me if they're using an open Bible. So we're in John chapter 5, verse 26. For the Father has life in himself, and so he has given to the Son to have life in himself. What does that mean? Well, here it's talking, that the general passage is talking about the resurrection of the dead, 
and, and he talks about the time when it would come when people will be called from the grave. And, and this is an incredible passage here. And I'll read a little bit more of it. Um, verse 27. And he has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the son of man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which they are in the grave shall hear his voice. And they shall come forward. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life and those that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Now this is interesting because only a few weeks ago we went to John chapter 11 and we looked at the resurrection of Lazarus. And here we see the nature of God being demonstrated in Jesus himself where he goes to the tomb of Lazarus and calls Lazarus forward. Jesus is the life giver. God is the life giver. It's interesting. Uh, I read the other day that scientists think they're just about at a point where they're about to maybe, possibly, perhaps make a breakthrough and be able to create life in a laboratory. Maybe was what they were saying. But they're more confident than they've ever been and they've only been working on this for about 70 years and they've only spent billions of dollars on doing it. But here is Jesus, here is God who can say, Lazarus, come forward. And a rotting corpse is brought back to health and to life at the utterance of his voice. He is the life giver. What an incredible thing that is. God is truth. And in the Gospel of John, there's a great emphasis on that. And perhaps I love the summary that's found in chapter 14, verse 6. John chapter 14, verse 6. Let's turn and have a look at that. Of course, this is uh, where Thomas, doubting Thomas, who we looked at the other week, uh, has asked him a question. How can we know? Where are you going? Well, how can we know these things, Lord? And Jesus says to him, that is Thomas, and this is John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. In him is all truth. In him is life. In him is the way. Let's move on in our list. God is all powerful all-knowing and ever-present. And we see the power of God demonstrated in creation. I'm not going to look at the verses of that. You could open almost anywhere in the Bible and you'll see reference to that. That the Lord said, let there be light. It begins in Genesis chapter 1. And there was light. At the word of God, creation occurred. But I want to go to Psalm 139 now. And we're going to look at the start of Psalm 139. And we're going to pick up in the first verse. This is Psalm 139. And it talks about God as being all-knowing and all-powerful. Listen to what the psalmist says. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my down-sitting and my uprising. You understand my thoughts from far away. That's pretty impressive. There's a lot of people who can't explain what they're thinking and yet here we have God who knows what they're thinking even though they don't. That's just interesting. For there is not a word in my mouth, but, O oh Lord, you know it all together. And then in verse 6, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain to it. God knows, understand things that we cannot even understand what he's talking about. 
and he's ever present. And the psalmist says this. He said, where shall I go where I am away from your spirit? This is in verse 7. How can I flee from your presence? For if I went up into heaven, you're there. If I make my way down to hell, behold, you're there. If I took the wings of the morning and dwelt at the other most parts of the world, of the sea, you're there. And so it goes. There is nowhere we can go where God is not present, where God does not know us, where God is not searching us out. He is ever present and he is holy. Holy. The second song the team brought to you today was inspired by the fourth chapter of Revelation. And it picks up the image of uh, the elders before the throne of God. It picks up the creatures gathered around. And here it is, the day where the judgments are beginning in heaven. And it says, and round, this is in chapter 4 of Revelation, I'm picking up in verse 4. And round about the throne there were 24 seats, and upon the seats I saw the 24 elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunder and voices. And there were the seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass, like unto crystal in the midst of the throne. And round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes in front and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast was like a calf, and the third beast was like, had the face like a man, and the fourth was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings. About I, I have trouble even picturing that. That is incredible. I, I can't even picture that. It's just beyond me. And they were full of eyes and they did not rest day or night. And they shouted. They said, holy, holy, holy Lord God almighty, who was and is and is to come, our great God. And when the beasts give glory and honour and thanks to him who sat upon the throne, the 24 elders would, cast their, would throw themselves down and cast their crowns before him, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honour and power, for you have created all things, and for your pleasure they are and were created. What an incredible picture. Here is a God that we could not know except it be he revealed in scripture. And then in Habakkuk, yes, I'm in one of those little books just before the New Testament starts, Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter 3, and I'm going to pick up verses 3 and 4. And uh, let's see. I've got to remember the order of these guys. Here we go, Habakkuk, just before Haggai and after Micah. And here we are, he's in chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. And God came from Teman, and the Holy One from the Mount Paran, Shalah. And his glory covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. And his brightness was as light, and he had horns coming out of his hand, and there was a hiding of his power. And it goes on to describe the greatness and the fearsomeness of God. Teman was to the east of Israel and Mount Param was to the north. And the image that Habakkuk gets 
is the glory of God rising upon the land as the sun would rise. But instead of coming from the southern side as it would in Jerusalem, he is coming more around to the north. He's showing that this is not the sun rising, but it has the appearance, the glory of God of the sun rising. In Matthew 24, 27, Jesus describes the day of his coming where he says that there would be lightning, lightning up the sky from the east to the west. There would be this great glorious revelation of the coming of God. We will not miss the coming of God. There is no way we could do that. But then there are the attributes of God that we see in ourselves, reflected in ourselves, because we are created in the image of God. We are told that God is love. You want to read about that? We won't go through the whole of 1 John, but that's the Bible reference, the whole book. 1 John, first. All five chapters speak of the love of God. The God is love. And all who truly love, not in the worldly sense, but in the scriptural sense, a selflessness, a giving, a sacrificial caring for one another, that comes from God. God is faithful. He is faithful to all generations. He is good. The psalmist says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. He is just. He is wise. But he's also jealous. Our God does not want to share us with evil. He does not want to share us with sins that would bind and entangle us. Our God is a jealous God. And we see the good things in us are often reflected. If we go to Galatians, we go to Galatians chapter 5. We have the fruit of the Spirit which essentially is the character of Jesus. And the theory is that if the spirit that is within us is that of the world, it will show as that of the world. There will be envy. There will be strife. There will be maliciousness. And it goes through the list. It talks about the fruit of the flesh. And it says the works of the flesh, and this is in verse 19 of chapter 5 of Galatians, but the works of the flesh are manifest. These are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, it says in mine, which which is just a, a, a vile passion. Idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murder, drunkenness, revellings. And so he talks about the vileness, the bitterness, the anger, where people devour one another for their own passions. But he says the fruit of the Spirit is different. And here we see the nature of God being revealed in his people. Here we see the attributes of God being made available to us through the power of the Holy Spirit who can transform a human life, can take a wretched person, cleanse them of that sinfulness, of that wretchedness, of that horrible nature and put a new heart in them and recreate them with his spirit. And when that happens, there is love. 
There is joy. There is peace. There is long suffering. Remember that was in our previous lift where, where, where God was going behind Moses and he says, I am the Lord, I am long suffering. And here we see that same long suffering. Our modern Bible's translated as patience, but patience doesn't quite cover it. You can patiently wait for a bus, find out it's missing and patiently wait for the next bus. But long suffering is the nature of a people who are being pressed, who are being abused, who are being ill-treated. And rather than rearing up like a snake and snapping back at their persecutors, they bless. They suffer long with the joy and love and peace of God in their heart. I don't want to get rid of that word long-suffering. I don't want to replace it with patience. They are gentleness, goodness. That was one of the other words that the Lord gave. I am good. None is good but God. But when the Spirit of God is in a person, that goodness of God becomes evident in that person. Faith is a gift of God. Faith, the ability to believe that God will care for us. Meekness. Meekness is not weakness. I want to tell you that. In our day, we tend to think of the meek person as being the weak person. But the meek person is the one who has the strength of character and the fortitude to endure others without complaint. The easiest thing there is to do is to get angry and retaliate. To deal with a situation with gentleness when you are being treated badly takes incredible courage and strength, particularly for those who before they were saved were capable of physical violence. To give that meekness as an incredible thing. Temperance. Not to indulge in whatever it is people need to get a buzz, but to go through life knowing that having Jesus in your soul is the only buzz you need. You know, when the Lord gets hold of you, alcohol means nothing. When the Lord gets hold of you, you don't need a quick fix because you've been permanently repaired. When the Lord gets hold of you, the things of the world just pass away. If we live in the Spirit of God, we will also walk in the Spirit of God. How can we know what God is like? Well, part of it we have to read. We have to study. We have to search. We have to encourage one another. We have to share with one another. There is no easy path. There is no easy fix There is a daily dose of scripture and prayer. There is no replacement for that. The disciplines of a godly life are essential. And there is only one way of truly knowing the awesomeness of God is through that daily discipline of praying, of reading, of fellowshipping, of caring, of giving, of loving. 
But there is a part of God we can know when we go on bended knees and say, here is my life, Lord. Broken. Here is my life with all its tragedy, with all its aches, with all its pains. Take this life, Lord. Get rid of the rubbish. Make it anew. There is the opportunity for God to come in and give us a new heart to take out that heart of stone that is cold and brittle within us and put in us a heart of flesh, one which he can fill, one which he can empower, one which he can abide in. And when God puts that heart of flesh in a person, when they have been born again of the Holy Spirit, when they are in Christ and Christ is in, in them, that person, that person will be new. I want to encourage you today. I want to encourage you today to come afresh to Jesus. I want to encourage you to be built anew. I want to encourage you to come to Jesus. Perhaps you've never given your heart to the Lord. Take this opportunity today, right where you are right now, and pray. Confess your sins to God. He is faithful and just and he will forgive you. Give glory to God and ask him to come in. He will take your sins and leave them at the cross and he will give you new life. Perhaps you would like to pray with me. Father God, as we come before you, we glory because there are things about you we could never know unless you revealed it to us in your word. And as we come, we realise that there are things in our life, things that should be reflecting you, but reflect someone very, very different to you. Lord, we confess that which is sin in our lives. We confess the meanness, the evil, the way in which we have used and abused others. And we ask, Lord, that you would cleanse our hearts, that you would forgive us of our iniquity, that you would take our sins and leave them at the cross, and that you would fill us anew today, faithful to your promise, for you are faithful and that you would give us your Holy Spirit, that you would put Christ in us and that we would be put into Christ, that we would be baptised spiritually into the kingdom of God. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
We're going to sing one more time, Worthy of It All.
Go forth into this week knowing that your Father in heaven cares for you. Go forward knowing that you are Christ's and that you have been crucified with him. Go forward in this week with the fruit of the Holy Spirit evident in your life, a life of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness and temperance. Go forward bearing the Spirit of Christ in fellowship and in harmony of the kingdom of heaven. Go forward into this week in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless. Have a great week.